So uh, my talk is about building commonality and politics of re-engagement. So the, way, the whole idea is to look at the, at the process of building collective identity in the context of Belarus from the perspective of sociological uh, processes and mainly the reassembling society. Because we know that those countries or states or societies which experience the disintegration of Soviet Union faced this challenge of rebuilding the collective identity and commonality of citizens live, or people living in the, on the territory of the state is in the frame of identity of uh, sovereign nations. And this, this task became very challenging uh, assignment for political and social actors and, uh, and agencies existing in this country. So my idea in this paper to discuss how, what, is this, what is the specific of this whole idea of rebuilding commonality uh, in the case of Belarus, which didn't embrace the path of a building ethnic democracy, what happens, for example, in Baltic countries. Uh, so I'll try to discuss this issue um, later on, but also one of the aspects of my presentation here, I mean, the, the talk is just a small part of my larger project, so I'll try to pick some elements, so forgive me if I, I'll be making shortcuts and missing some elements, you can ask questions later on if you feel like I really missed too much. Uh, studies of the societies of transformation mostly focus on the paradigm of building commonality in Eastern European countries, in countries of state, former state socialism, so-called, usually as achieved as by development of civil society. So civil society is a specific form of social organization that has been viewed as a necessary precondition of political and social engagement of individuals. So this rebuilding commonality requires civil society sector as a, something which is civil society sector which consists of secondary groups which are considered to be effective mechanism of distancing from state. So we have individuals, we have state, and we need civil society sector in order to build commonality of the whole society within state, nation state. From this perspective, the, the civil society is actually considered to be an ideal self-organization of society outside of the state control. It's already Durkheim noted that secondary groups play, in, play a very important role of the intermediary between venues Sorry, which become venues through which the moral authority of state can reach or um, enter the individual's life. So without these groups, the moral authority of the state is considered to be too distant, too far away from individual to play the universalizing role of and um, basis for building commonality within society. In the post-communist conditions or post-Soviet conditions, the opposite is also true. So the civil society, the interests of the individual gain the opportunity to be communicated to the state. Studies of the social order in Belarus often focus on the overly centralized and non-democratic character of the political regime that blocks individuals' engagement in building commonality by precluding civil society development. So society is assumed to be comprised of atomized individuals somehow lost in between former state socialist and new post-socialist political system and having no voice to public arena because of lack in this civil society sector. So the logic of state society relations formed under previous socialist order, which omitted the mediating space of civil society sector, um, appears to be reiterated re and repeated once again in Belarus. But in my paper, I want to kind of demonstrate how this logic of state former socialist logic had been revoked and recycled in post-socialist scenario of Belarusian development. In what kind of specific strategies and instruments of citizens' engagement in the society's commonality can exist in this context? One of the specific characteristics of the post-Soviet states with strong centralized power system and also official ideology 
which strives to represent the collective identity, is the declared aspiration to reduce the distance between the state and individual and to make people believe that there is no such distance even exist. So the country as a community of citizens, as a home of nation, as a peoplehood, has been represented as embedded in the daily routine of individual, both as a built background and also as a symbolic frame for the mundane practices. During the Soviet past, state has its declared objectives to transform all aspects of social life. And this was according to the ideological or Leninist or Marxist blueprint. After the fall of communist system, the failed ideology was replaced by the state ideology, which doesn't have any particular message in terms of philosophical framing of the social being, but instead focuses on the glorification of national statehood. State in this discourse has been presented as an entity belonging to nation as existing and acting in the name of its people. While the border between state and society and individual becomes unimportant and thus non-existent. In the newly independent states, ruling elites usually start to position themselves as protectors of the citizens' interests while re-establishing and reformatting the whole narrative of the nation and state development. The mundane routine of statization, various social practices and interactions in this context become transformed into the means of recruiting individuals into the state building project. In this way, the state successfully utilizes the socialist societal habitus built on the hegemonial state in the relations with this society and framing new collective identities. Among the socialist uh, practices was also the whole idea of using public space and urban environment as a whole, as a site of ideological programming. So citizens become engaged in, into a state building project. When we turn to Belarus and especially the case of Minsk as a capital city, so citizens become engaged into the state building project via different elements of using the Soviet, uh, public space. For example, romanticization of the pre-Soviet national tradition. As you see, this is a uh, building of Upper Town, and we'll hear it later within this panel of the pre presentation on the Upper Town. So I'm very glad that we will be kind of communicating with other papers in the panel. Uh, also, the positive aspects of the Soviet experience in case of Belarus, and here you see fragments of, as I said, it's just for, especially for those who haven't been to Belarus. Uh, pos positive aspects of pos Soviet experience. Uh, if, if, I don't know if many of you know that in 2004, Belarus submitted uh, Skarini at that time, later Independence Avenue, to a UNESCO held, uh, heritage, World Heritage Site. Uh, at the moment, in 2014, the, actually the application was withdrawn. But now they are preparing the new submission, so it's not, it wasn't withdrawn because they don't want it anymore, they just want to reconsider the whole application and the, the portfolio to make it probably more uh, successful, potentially. Uh, and finally, in addition to this pre-Soviet and Soviet past, there, is an, there are elements of glorification of the present time state, status quo presented as a step on the way to future national achievements. So this is just some fragments of uh, Scarini Avenue, former Scarini Avenue, Independence Avenue right now. So alongside with commercial advertising uh, in public space in Belarus, you, ca you can find a lot of um, images, so-called social advertising, in which the state promotes itself uh, and also promotes strategies of identification between citizens and state, endorsing the idea of stateness as a form of, and form of the collective subject related directly to individuals. For example, in 2004, there was a uh, series promoting campaign of Belarus was launched for Belarus, and later it was uh, different adjectives were added to this. I mean, those who live in Belarus, of 
perfectly known this for, for prosperous Belarus, for genuine, for enlightened Belarus, for talented, heroic, etc. And those are just some images. So among the most popular vis visual subjects used in the social advertisement are natural la uh, landscapes, so cultural heritage, historical events, also connection between generations. And each of these topics is communicating with the clear emphasis on the belonging, shared ownership, and unitedness. The images represent the diverse members of the society from the army officers, war combatants, construction workers, farmers, school teachers, and the number of the collective subjects, families, as children, uh, couples, work in this series as a metaphor of abstract subject existing at the, blurred, at the blurred border between state and individual. An essential, essential feature of this visual series, the direct appeal to the individual and they appear to, signal, to strengthen the primary groups in the society while implicitly presenting the state society as a form of collective being and as one of such primary groups. What is produced in this way is an ultimate feeling of shared tradition, responsibilities, fate, and hope. So I just got closed. So in a way, these forms of representation of state try to achieve what already Durkheim uh, thought is not longer, longer possible in modern times. Thinking of the state as a patriarchal authority and as a society, as a family on a greater scale. So while civil society actors usually constitute the secondary groups that tend to emancipate this from state control and break power of primary group bonds, this uh, Belarusian official rhetoric insists on the importance of the primary groups in the society while projecting the organic kinship onto the societal level on the scope of society. So society in this context aspires to be understood as state society based on the foundation of learned natural affinity of all members. In this context, the fostered association between state, society, and individual the participation of individual in the state building project, which is led, controlled, and maintained by state, has been reinterpreted as a form of their engagement in social life. <clears throat> there is an official defect in such an idealized picture of state, state society and individual harmony imposed by the official policies of social cohesion. In first place, it concerns the principal inability to integrate the views of those who do not subscribe to the official project of state building. According to Jung, any modern society, state is featured by the discourse of universal reason in which the particular perspectives of dominant groups claim universality, marginalizing all others. In countries like Belarus, the public space dominated by state represents the extreme case of state which is drawing the boundaries of the legitimacy, excluding those members of the society who fail to stay within these limits. And uh, yet, although I have only two, limit, two minutes left, I want to uh, talk uh, during these two minutes about the alternative strategies, and yet those mechanisms of communication between state and society, which do exist in the context of hegemonic state like Belarus. And I'd like to illustrate this case with the recent uh, case which occurred with, in Belarus with a rec recent protest. It happened because I'm dealing mostly with urban space, so they, I've chosen this protest about a uh, confectionery store, Lakomka, which occurred in 2015. Of course, those who have been to Minsk probably know this day, play, place. The confectionery store, which was opened in 1952 in it preserved its name throughout all these decades of Soviet and post-Soviet urban transformations. In the year 2015, the owners, the, the store became joint, just closed joint stock company in 1993. And the owner decided to transform it into the fast food restaurant, Burkin King. And Minsk City Council approved this plan. After the information was published in media in September 2015, it provoked 
a wave of uh, critical publications, and especially in inter internet media, but also in newspapers, major old Belarusian newspapers. So the decision triggered a wave of publications on the cult places of Minsk associated with Soviet past. There was an interactive instant opinion poll organized by the internet resource online, onliner.by proposing to answer the question, do you think that Lakomka, woman in translation, is one of the symbols of Minsk? All publications in digital media were followed by active discussions on forums on the role of the story in, here in the historical on the urban history of Minsk, uh, about the value for the, uh, this uh, store as a historical site, and also about the emotional attachments of people to the store association with childhood memories, etc. Uh, the same month's petition was also launched on the website change.org, but it only collected 265 signatures out of 500 which were required for the pe petition to be submitted, once the city council announced it, it annulled the decision to rebrand the store. Okay, just two phrases. <laughs> the protest was successful. Even though it was not really organized, there were no straight rallies, there were no uh, uh, normal protest activities which would demonstrate how people are able to organize into some sort of actors in order to appeal and communicate with state. And yet it was successful. So my ultimate, uh, it's really two last phrases, but this, this protest case demonstrates that actually state didn't really want to see any intermediary actors to enter the space in between individuals and state and to communicate. Instead, it preferred to hear voices in individuals. And this is how it happens, and so it's not quite surprising that the major mechanism of communicating now with state in Belarus is writing petitions. And usually they are be, the, the requirements are being fulfilled even before the petitions are submitted. Thank you for your attention.